So I'm going to talk with you today about cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And since these lectures wind up on YouTube, in case anybody's watching, I want to say I have always been a supporter of legal marijuana. My personal belief is that anybody who chooses to use, any adult who's well informed who chooses to use cannabis should have the ability to do so without fear of prosecution. Um, that said, I am also in favor that people who do choose to use it go into using it knowing all the potential side effects and risks. Um, I think it's uh, important to know. And with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, um, people who currently use cannabis, as well as the physicians who are working with these very large numbers of people, should be very well aware of this because as cannabis goes more and more mainstream, and especially as it's promoted as a medicine substance and people are thereby encouraged to use it regularly over extended periods of time, it's quite likely that we're going to see more and more of this thing called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which, as I will show to you in a few slides from now, is really unpleasant and potentially very dangerous. So let's talk about uh, what it is. It is it's a syndrome of cyclical vomiting. Cycles of vomiting can happen between every few weeks to every few months. I know one individual who had um, CHS and his episodes of um, waves of nausea and vomiting happened more or less um, on the cycle of once every nine months or so. But once these episodes start, they are repetitive vomiting and the vomiting can be very frequent. Um, in some cases, um, in, in one of the papers that I read, there are reports of somebody who was vomiting 40 times per hour, um, accompanied by oftentimes intense stomach pain and nausea. The concerning thing about CHS is that the usual anti-nausea and anti-emetic drugs are essentially not effective. And an interesting feature of CHS is that people who experience this eventually discover, and the data say between 70 to 90% of individuals discover this on their own, that being in very hot water provides relief. And so people with CHS will spend a lot of time um, in hot baths or hot showers. This is a, something that occurs in people who have used cannabis regularly. Um, and regularly can be from about weekly to daily or multiple times today. It, but it has been reported in people who have used it as, as infrequently as once or twice per week. And typically there has to be many months or, or more often many years of continuous use in that pattern. Um, CHS is almost defined by it resolves after stopping cannabis. And uh, there are, there are um, many people report um, potentially many years of sort of nondescript nausea typically happening in the morning before the, the cycling vomiting, the cycle of vomiting um, presents itself. Um, here is a first person account of uh, what it felt like from somebody who did experience um, CHS. In her case, um, she was coming home from a party and felt sick, and then she says it wasn't just ordinary sickness, it felt like um, she had swallowed the sun and it was intensely painful. And, um, and, and there we see again the 30 seconds of relief after vomiting before the nausea starts again. Uh, it can be in some cases extremely frequent and that can be um, lead to extreme danger as most physicians will realize. This is an interesting thing because it wasn't officially described in the literature until around 2004, but um, Mitch Earlywine wrote a book about um, marijuana science and he found some mention in, in Arabic writings from the 11th century warning that uh, regular hashish consumers are liable to die from continuous vomiting. And it's also... Um, is kind of hidden in plain sight because THC is an approved drug. Physicians can prescribe it. Um, it goes under the name dr dronabinol or the brand name Marinol. And if you look in the dronabinol prescribing information, it will say right there, it actually has a big warning in, in the prescribing information that says that severe nausea and vomiting can happen, which can lead to electrolyte disturbances and, um, and so forth. And it's not infrequent between 3% and 10% of people with short-term exposure to THC will experience this very paradoxical 
uh, side effect from it. And, and because it is paradoxical, um, it's, a, it's a frequently misdiagnosis. Um, it is, I mean, one of, the reasons we, one of the reasons that THC is approved is to treat intractable nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy. It's a very useful and a very strong antiemetic agent, um, but it does have that paradoxical effect. And, but we don't think usually about the paradoxical effect. So typically when somebody who is using cannabis and, and this is a, this is a, this is a tardive side effect. It comes, it comes along very late in the course of chronic use. Uh, so the, the, the cannabis consumer will not have experienced this before when he or she begins to experience nausea, then, oh, I could, I should use more cannabis because that can relieve nausea. And in some cases it does temporarily forestall it. Um, but it seems to set up a bigger a bigger problem down the road. Um, but because of this well-known anti-nausea effect, a lot of people don't catch it, both consumers and clinical providers. And also when such individuals um, go to emergency departments, if they should wind up with a clinician in an emergency department who knows about CHS, um, the, the patient may not report um, any cannabis use or may greatly under-report their use of cannabis because it is um, still illegal in many places, and it is often stigmatized. And, um, and as I said, if, if they're lucky enough to have a clinician who does recognize this condition, um, the other problem with marijuana is that having, due to its um, past legal status, it's not widely taught in medical schools. And so a lot of clinicians, especially, well, even today, but especially from 2004 and the following 10 years were completely unaware of this as a diagnosis. And that can lead to a lot of problems. Um, if you, if, so one study of, this, this study that I cited is, is typical of the reports that I get from every person that's had CHS that tells me about their experience. Um, it's missed and, and in this analysis, for five years, um, symptoms were present before they showed up for attention. After they started to present to the medical system with complaints, um, it required an average of 17 emergency department visits, an average of seven hospital admissions, an average of five abdominal CAT scans, not to mention the abdominal x-rays or the abdominal ultrasounds. Um, and these are all very costly. So 95,000 was the average or the mean cost uh, in this analysis, but it did go up to $268,000. So um, it's a lot of consequence for missing the diagnosis and partly why I am happy to talk about this today. So um, how big is the risk? And by this, I mean like how likely is it that a person who uses cannabis is going to experience uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome? Going to approach this question from two points of view. First, we're going to look at some um, population data from Colorado, uh, the epicenter of cannabis legalization in the US. Um, in 2009, there were changes to the laws in Colorado that um, drastically um, it, it made cannabis much easier to obtain. It wasn't fully legal for recreational use until 2014, but in 2009, there was a substantial change of, of laws, which resulted, as you can see, in a skyrocketing number of people holding mar medical marijuana cards. From the year before liberalization, you had 5,000 card holders. In the, the, the year following, you had 118,000. Um, and then the number of the number of emergency room visits didn't really change appreciably, but the number of visits related to cyclic vomiting doubled. Um, and here you see the conundrum. If you have 125,000 emergency room visits, only 87 of those were for something that would be reminiscent of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It can seem like a trivial problem if you look at giant population data. Nonetheless, following wider access, you saw close to a doubling of the presentations of those cases. A more recent study was published in 2019. This looked at a Denver um, emergency room, emergency department visits uh, from 2012 to 2016. And here we see the number of visits that were on, on the dotted line on the graph, you see the number of visits that were attributed to inhaled cannabis, um, the, the solid line, the number of visits attributed to edible cannabis. Um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, uh, almost exclusively happened in, 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 in users of inhaled cannabis because these folks are the ones who are using it, um, are, 
people who use cannabis regularly are much more likely to use it by inhaled roots than by edibles. Um, and CHS visits were accounting for one in one every thousand emergency room visits and a total of 440 cases um, from that period. So again, it, it looks like maybe not a giant number, but these numbers are underestimates for sure. Uh, we're looking at, I mean, the number of cases are buried in the number of cases for every other medical complaint on planet Earth. Um, and many people don't recognize this as a problem. They may not seek medical attention or they may not go to the emergency department. So we'll probably see bigger numbers in future studies, um, but these are the numbers from you get from emergency departments. The numbers look a lot more impressive if you focus on people who are regular consumers. So in this uh, Spanish study, you saw the people who had been, who were, showing up for substance dependence treatment were asked about cannabis use disorder and were asked about uh, symptoms of CHS. So 18% um, of people who met criteria for cannabis use disorder endorsed several symptoms that were suggestive of CHS and 9% endorsed every single item on the checklist. So um, let's call that maybe 10% conservatively of people who were uh, using more using frequently enough to acquire a cannabis use disorder diagnosis, wound up reporting um, CHS symptoms, and this was a study from New York City, published in 2018, single emergency department. Um, essentially, anybody that walked in the door was asked to complete a survey that asked about cannabis use and about symptoms of CHS. So one kind of, for me, eye-opening statistic was that in this single emergency department, 7% of ER patients reported that they were used cannabis more than four times per week. That was the definition of near daily or daily use. And of this group who were near daily or daily users, a third um, expressed or endorsed symptoms of uh, nausea that was relieved by hot showers or hot water. So it, 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 it being a new syndrome uh, with not a whole lot of researchers in the field, we're left to, uh, we don't have really great data about prevalence or risk, but the data that we do have on the frequent users suggests that this is, this is not um, a trivial or a minor risk. This is actually a, a pretty significant risk for people who are, who are regular consumers. And it's a problem. Um, again, as I said, as physicians were, are well aware, repetitive vomiting, in addition to the obvious dehydration, causes the body to lose a bunch of potassium and have other electrolyte disturbances. Um, and with those disturbances, you have um, the risk of acute renal injury or acute renal failure. In addition to those things, you have, in addition to being dehydrated from the continuous loss of, of water by vomit, um, you also have the problem that people are running to hot showers or hot baths and they're actually sweating in those things. So they're losing more of their liquids through, um, through, through the perspiration route. And in addition, many people with CHS are getting, are getting scald wounds from the hot water that they are, um, you know, the hotter the better and um, that leads to some accidents. And then between, the, between all those things, you can, you, you have re, there have been reported cases of death from essentially consequences of electrolyte, electrolyte disturbance and, uh, well, and renal failure. And uh, you can imagine that this would drive some people to consider suicide and indeed suicidal thinking and suicidal attempts have been reported uh, as a consequence of CHS. So this is, once established, it is, um, it is, it is very painful and very serious. Why does it happen? Uh, no clear idea. The best, the best, the, the idea that makes the most sense, and these have all been reported in the literature, the idea that makes the most sense is that the cannabinoid receptors in the brain, which normally mediate an anti-emetic response, those receptors are downregulated. So they're constantly getting exposed to THC and the body simply makes less of them and they become less active. So you lose, um, like if you will, a first line defense against nausea and that makes vomiting more likely to happen. 
uh, combine that with the fact that those same receptors in the gut um, cause the gut to slow down and cause blood vessels in the gut to expand. And both of those effects are tip one toward nausea or vomiting. So between having gut signals that make you want to vomit and having reduced brain activity to counteract that, that is a very likely explanation for why you have the, the CHS phenomenon. Additionally, uh, some of the, some of the, there, there are many hundred, there are about a hundred cannabis related chemicals and not all of them are fun. Uh, some of them actually um, produce, uh, can, can, tend to, can tend to produce nausea or vomiting. And a theory goes that with long-term users, these pro-emetic cannabinoids accumulate in fat tissues and then can exert their, their deleterious effects. And related to that, some people may have an ability to metabolize cannabinoids in a way that will accumulate those pro-emetic metabolites. And finally, there's this um, very complicated receptor we'll call TRPV1. And it is um, involved in vomiting reflexes. When active, it suppresses it. Um, THC, chronic THC use will cause TRPV1 levels to be lower and become less effective. And um, I mentioned that because one of the agonists for TRPV1 is capsaicin, the hot pepper ingredient. And um, if, you, if you rub capsaicin cream on the abdomen, that is probably more effective than many other treatments for, um, for, for CHS. On the topic of treatment, obviously the, the first thing to do is, is to do electrolyte and fluid replacement. Uh, with chronic vomiting, the stomach becomes irritated, so giving um, drugs like Pepsid or, or Prilosec um, are used to try to eliminate that stomach discomfort signal, which can tip a person into nausea um, cycles. Um, you certainly can try the usual anti-emetic medications, but uh, across the board, no matter what approach you use or what class of medicines are chosen, they have uh, very limited efficacy. There are some reports that suggest that uh, haloperidol or lorazepam or that hot pepper ingredient capsaicin are, to be, are more likely to be effective, but the effectiveness is still lackluster. Um, the thing that does seem to work, um, if, if maybe the only thing or certainly the most reliably effective thing is cessation of cannabis. And some people can start to get relief within a few weeks. Um, some people, unfortunately, require many, many months of abstinence before they begin to have a relief of symptoms. And that, for the consumer, is a very difficult position because if you're going to stop using something that gave you a modicum of relief and you're still going to have nausea and vomiting, uh, it's a very difficult situation to be in. So to summarize, this is, this is actually a very serious side effect. It's um, probably more common than most people believe it to be. And as we, as, as marijuana is promoted as a medical substance, and as more and more states add more approved medical conditions, you're going to have more and more people using it on a frequent basis. So I expect you'll see more um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome press and awareness as we get more people suffering from it. It shouldn't surprise anybody that this happens because THC does have a pro-emetic effect in some people who use it. Paradoxical effects happen all the time in psychopharmacology. Simplest example is that SSRIs, which are anxiety and antidepressant relieving drugs, actually can cause uh, depression-like symptoms and anxiety in some people. And we also see that uh, drugs that are useful for one thing with chronic use can actually cause the thing that they're supposed to treat. A classic example is people who take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for headaches. Um, if they take them every day for months or years can wind up with the worst headaches of their lives. Uh, so none of this should be surprising. Um, and therefore I, I would assert that um, states that recognize marijuana as medical substance uh, have a duty to specifically warn people about this possibility and uh, promote clinician awareness of this as an entity and, and uh, take steps to try to limit the damage. So those are my slides on CHS.